All right, well, if you'll open with me to Mark chapter 7. Uh, This morning we're going to be in verses 31 through 37. You know, as we make our way through the gospel of Mark, uh, we continue to see the prominent role that miracles played in Jesus' ministry. We've seen a lot of miracles. In fact, uh, as we look at our text this morning, by my count, this is the 13th miracle detailed in Mark. And that's not even including the passing references to Jesus, you know, healing people along the way, things like that. This is the thir- uh, 13th miracle that's detailed in Mark. And uh, here we'll see the, the healing of a deaf man. The healing of a deaf man. And not only was he deaf, uh, but he was also mute, uh, or at least had a speech impediment. Uh, we'll kind of come back to that question uh, later on in the sermon, but uh, he at the very least had a speech impediment, and uh, he was healed both uh, in his hearing and in his speaking. As often is the case, uh, some things are left to our imagination. Um, for example, as I look at this story, I, uh, I have to wonder, what was the first thing that this man heard? Now, we're going to see that Jesus speaks a word, a word in Aramaic that means be opened, in order to heal this man. But of course, when Jesus said that, the man's deaf, right? So what did the man hear? What was the first thing that he heard? I mean, maybe it was just like the uh, uh, footsteps passing along the path, or maybe it was the wind blowing through the trees, or the birds chirping, the kinds of things that we often take for granted. Uh, but all of a sudden, this man could hear. And not only could he hear, but he, he could speak. It says that he uh, spoke freely, and uh, we're not told what he spoke either. And so, again, those things are left to our imagination. Um, Perhaps only he and Jesus know, because uh, as we'll see, that uh, Jesus actually kind of takes him off to the side when he performs this miracle. Uh, but now, 2,000 years later, uh, we can rejoice in simply knowing that this man did indeed hear and he did indeed speak. As I considered uh, this passage throughout the week, I noticed that uh, this miracle really exemplifies the multifaceted function of miracles in Jesus' ministry. That is to say that Jesus performed his miracles, I believe, for a number of reasons. And uh, that kind of makes sense out of why we see so many miracles, right? Uh, as, as we continue through uh, this, this account of Jesus' life, uh, I think that he per- performed these miracles for a number of reasons. And uh, this one, I think, is especially helpful in helping us to see those. And so uh, we'll read the text together, and and then afterwards we're going to see four functions of a miracle, okay? If you would stand with me in honor of reading God's Word, we're going to begin in chapter 7, verse 31. And then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephetha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. But they were all astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Let's pray. God, you have indeed done all things well. And as we look at this miracle, we marvel at uh, Jesus' ministry and these miracles that he performed. I pray, Lord, that as we uh, dig into this text, Lord, help us to see uh, the reason for these miracles, what they mean for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so four functions of a miracle. So normally I just have a couple of points. We've got four this morning, so we're going to have to go a little bit more quickly, okay? Um, uh, but, But here they are. First is we see that this is a merciful act of compassion, Number two, it's a tangible illustration of our spiritual redemption. Number three, it's a taste of our physical redemption. And then number four, a proof that Jesus is the promised Redeemer. So I went through those pretty quickly, right? 
And that's going to sum it up for us this morning. Um, no, that's, that's, that's just the preview. Um, now, before we jump into the first of these, uh, I should point out that this healing is uh, likely of a Gentile once again. So remember last week, um, this uh, Syrophoenician woman that comes to Jesus, she was a Gentile, and there was, uh, there was a lot of significance in that. And so once again, uh, it seems that this is probably a Gentile. We at least know that, that this is in Gentile territory. Right, you, you see there at the very beginning of, of our passage, it makes mention of, of where he's going through and, and the region of Decapolis. Uh, this was a uh, Gentile-dominated area, and, and the route that Jesus took, it seems as though this was very intentional. Right? So I do think that Jesus is seeking to show that, um, that, uh, that the Gentiles, uh, that he's there to minister to them as well. Uh, but anyway, here we see that uh, first Jesus performs... A merciful act of compassion. Right, so verse 32 says, They brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. They begged him. We, we've seen that again and again and again, haven't we? Even just last week, right? We see this lady falls at Jesus' feet and begs him. And then in other accounts, we see that people are begging Jesus And again and again and again, we've seen Jesus respond with compassion. No matter who they were, no matter what their need was. So if we look back... um I think all the way to chapter 1, right? Remember, remember the leper that Jesus heals, right? The person that has this skin disease. Um, there in particular, it says that he was moved with compassion. It says, moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand and touched her. While the word compassion uh, may not appear in, in this particular passage, uh, I think it is nevertheless evident. We see Jesus' compassion in this story. Uh, in verse 33, we see that Jesus takes this man aside privately. Right? He's giving this man his undivided attention. And then he, he incorporates some things into his healing that we have yet to see in Mark. Right? So verse 33, this where it gets a little bit weird maybe. Right? He says, taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue, which actually is implying that he's He's using his spit. He's, he's touching his tongue with his spit, right? Which, uh, oh, that's really gross. There's a purpose in this. But what is the purpose of it? Um, one thought, one thought that I have here is that, um, well, this man cannot hear, nor can he speak. And so we see that Jesus is communicating what he's doing in another way, right? He can't speak to the man. He can't have a conversation with the man. And so we see something very different in this miracle from all the ones that precede it, right? So I think that has something to do with it, that Jesus is communicating what he is doing in another way. Uh, But still, it might seem kind of weird, right? Especially from our 21st century context, we're looking back and we're thinking, okay, that's kind of strange, maybe even kind of gross. Um, But I think uh, it's even, it makes even more sense when we understand that these practices were actually common among those who purported to have the gift of healing. Now, key word is purported, right? There were people who claimed to have the gift of healing. Uh, we might even call them charlatans, uh, whatever the case. There were people in that, in, that, uh, in that day that claimed to have this gift, and, and they would use these kinds of tactics, uh, like using their saliva, for example. And so maybe it wasn't so weird or so gross then, um, Of course, Jesus, uh, he didn't need any of these tactics, right? Again, we've seen that all of the miracles up until now, he hasn't done anything like this. He doesn't need any of these tactics. Uh, He could heal without even saying a word, much less without applying his saliva to a person, right? I mean, in in some of these other cases, he just says, hey, uh, you know, your daughter who's, who's like way off many, many miles away, she's healed, she's good, right? Like, he can do that. And that was his normal practice, right, to, to not really have any of, of these tactics, we might call them. But perhaps in order to, commu- to, to clearly communicate through his actions what he was setting out to do, Jesus chose to mimic this common cultural practice. So I think it kind of goes hand in hand with the fact that, okay, this guy, he can't hear, he can't speak, so Jesus is communicating in another way, and he's communicating according to 
a, a common cultural practice. He's saying, hey, I'm, I'm setting out to heal you, right? The guy would have known that, right? Okay, he's, he is setting out to heal me. And, uh, of course, the big difference is that Jesus actually heals him, right? There's no, there's no smoke and mirrors or anything here. Uh, this is a bona fide healing. But uh, I think the way Jesus does this is, is very incarnational, right? So, you know the word incarnation? Um, uh, so it actually means like in the flesh. So like when you get chili con carne at a Mexican restaurant, it's like chili with flesh, <laughs> with meat. Right? That, kind of, that might kind of gross you out a little bit. Um, so I think, it, I think it goes back to the Latin, uh, to the Latin root. But, uh, but incarnation means in the flesh. And so usually when we talk about the incarnation, we talk about how Jesus, right, he stepped down from heaven and took on human flesh. Right? That's pretty incredible that God would step down from heaven, God the Son, and take on human flesh. So that's what we call the incarnation, right? But I think we see in Jesus' life and ministry that there were many things that he did that we might say are incarnational in, in the sense that not only did he become a man, but like here, for example, we see that uh, he is even willing to, in a sense, speak the language of those that he ministered to. He really like lowered himself down to their place, to their context. Right? So I think that's what we see going on here. And it's kind of similar with uh, the man we'll see later. I think it's in chapter 8, uh, the, the man who he heals from blindness. We see that he also uses his saliva in that case as well. Okay? Um, but finally, as we consider the, the compassion of Jesus here, I, I want you to notice in verse 34. In verse 34, it says, And looking up to heaven, he sighed. He sighed. And then he said, Ephatha, be opened. So, why does Jesus sigh? That's something that I really like pondered on for a while um, as I was uh, thinking about this text over the week. Why does Jesus sigh? Well, let's ask the question, why do we ever sigh? Well, we might sigh for lots of reasons, but uh, I wonder, have you ever sighed just, just thinking about the sin and suffering in the world. Maybe you turn the news on and you see just like some of the terrible things going on and you just, you just sigh. I think we see that Jesus is sympathizing with this man's suffering. And we can also have, take comfort in the fact that he sympathizes with our suffering. I'm going to say more on this later, but for now, um, I just wanted to point that out. We see that Jesus sighs. And then, of course, we see here that it leads to a truly merciful act of compassion as he heals this man. Okay? So first we see that uh, uh, this miracle, and really all of Jesus' miracles, uh, were, were merciful acts of compassion. Number two, we see that it's a tangible illustration of our spiritual redemption. So we've seen this with other miracles. So one that I've already mentioned, like the, the healing of the leper. Uh, the cleansing of the leper, uh, we might call it. Um, what a poignant picture of how Christ cleanses us from our, uncleansli- from our uncleanliness. Right? Remember when we looked at that passage together? There's, there's a very clear illustration there. Right? Jesus cleanses us from our uncleanliness, just as he cleansed this unclean leper. Or looking, again, look, looking ahead again to, to the blind man. All right, well, that, that one's really easy. We, in fact, we sang it this morning, right? I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. Right? So just with these other miracles, right, we can see how, uh, how they are tangible illustrations of our spiritual redemption. I don't think that these parallels are just a happy coincidence. I really do think that these are intentional, and not only in the miracles, but even like if we look back um, Let's say to the, to the deliverance of the Hebrews in the Old Testament, right? This is something that really clicked with me uh, in our Sunday school, in our class. We're, we were kind of going through a chronological study of the Bible. And so as we were going through the story of, of the Exodus, right, how God delivered his people from Egypt, um, man, we just, we just see these powerful illustrations of how God delivers us. And I think it's all on purpose, right? I mean, God is sovereign over all things, and he, he's, like, he, he's setting things in motion so that these stories show us 
even these greater realities within us, these spiritual realities. So we can see it, uh, for example, with, um, as we consider the story of the Exodus, think about uh, the tenth plague, the Passover lamb. Right? Through the Passover lamb, the people were freed from death and slavery. And so it is with us. Right? Through Jesus, our Passover lamb, we are freed from death and slavery. So all that to say that, that God is in the business of giving us tangible illustrations of the work that he does within us. Whether we're looking at some Old Testament story or whether we're looking at these miracles that Jesus performs. So, considering our miracle this morning, right, the healing of the deaf man. Isn't it interesting that multiple times Jesus has called upon his audience to hear what he is saying? You remember that? And then more than once he employs the phrase, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. We've talked about that a little bit, haven't we? We've seen that in the text as we've gone through Mark. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Here, you think that uh, there might be a connection here? Let me say a little bit more about uh, this phrase, ears to hear. It's actually first used by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. Right, so Deuteronomy 29.4 says this. Moses says to the people, says, But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. There's a couple of things we can gather from that. First of all, on one hand, especially in the context, it's clear that the people of Israel, they're being held responsible for their hard hearts, their blind eyes, their deaf ears, right? Moses is, in a sense, chastising them because of their hardness of heart, because of their blind eyes, because of their deaf ears. But notice he says, but to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. So we see at the same time, even though they are, in fact, held responsible for it, We see that their only hope is that the Lord would give them a heart to understand, eyes to see, and ears to hear. And I think that Jesus means to to say the same thing when he employs this phrase, right? When he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, yes, we all have that responsibility. We bear that responsibility, and yet, right, that is we're responsible for our deafness. But at the same time, our only hope is that Jesus speaks the word, Ephatha be opened, and that we would experience a same kind of miracle spiritually, that our ears would be opened, that we would indeed have ears to hear. So maybe maybe you're here this morning, and if you were completely honest, you would say, you know, I I, I just, I don't really get this. Uh, Maybe you're here for the first time. Maybe you've come to church for for 20 years, though, and and maybe you just kind of dragged here or whatever. Um, but, but you say, you know, you know I, I just don't really get, like, like, like why people are, are into this. I, I, don't, I don't really get um, what this has to do with me and my life. I, I just don't get it. Well, if there is anything in you, anything in you at all that wants to get it, beg the Lord that he would give you ears to hear. Or perhaps your loved ones who do get it need to beg on your behalf. Because notice in verse 32, it says, And they brought to him a deaf man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him, right? They begged Jesus to give him ears to hear. Of course, with deafness often comes muteness. Maybe you're not in the position to beg for yourself, but to my brothers and sisters here, maybe you have someone who's in this room or someone who's just in your life, right? Some, someone that, that um, you think, okay, I don't think that they really have ears to hear. I think they have a spiritual deafness. They just don't get it. Well, you can beg the Lord just as these people begged the Lord. You can beg that they would be given ears to hear. We all need ears to hear in order to respond to the gospel and be saved. And then we must continually have ears to hear as we continue along in our journey, right? And so this is something we can pray, we can pray for all of us. We say, Lord, give us all ears to hear. We need that. And so we see we see a picture here, right? We see that uh, that there is a 
a tangible illustration of our spiritual redemption. Because when a person does finally get it, when it clicks, and whenever they come to the Lord with faith and repentance, right, they have been given ears to hear. It is indeed a miraculous thing. Number three, we see that uh, this miracle is a taste of our physical redemption. And I think we can say this of all of Jesus' miracles. A taste of our physical redemption. All right, so there's no doubt that our greater need is spiritual, right? We need a new heart. We need spiritual eyes to see. We need spiritual ears to hear. But Jesus came not only to redeem us spiritually, but also physically. Right, he came for the physically deaf, mute, blind, lame, those who have chronic disease, cancer, those whose bodies are wasting away, which that would include all of us, wouldn't it? All of our bodies are wasting away. And just let me pause here and say for a moment, because I know that uh, maybe the question comes up. We, we see all these miracles that Jesus is performing, and we think, okay, well, do those things happen today? Well, I do believe that the Lord performs miracles today. But what we see in Jesus' ministry is, is just this a huge concentration of miracles, right? There's something very special about it. Um, and, and I think we're kind of getting to the heart of that as we go through these three functions, uh, or these four functions of miracles, right? That is of Jesus' miracles. I do believe that the Lord still performs miracles today, but it's a rare thing, right? Uh, by definition, it's a rare thing. And, and God has his purposes for, for, for everything that we go through, okay? Um, I could say a whole lot more on that, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. But, uh, but even so, even, even though you may not receive immediate, immediate physical healing, understand Jesus did, in fact, come for your physical redemption. I think it's helpful to see Jesus' earthly ministry, uh, these miracles that Jesus performed in his earthly ministry, as, as merely a taste of what is to come. Merely a taste of what's to come. Because, you know, even with those who were healed, um, well, guess what? They, they all eventually died, didn't they? Right? And so this deaf man, he died. And not only did he lose function of his ears and his tongue, he lost function of everything, right? He died. And so, and so these miracles, they're temporary, right? They're just merely a taste of what is to come. So we can praise God that there is indeed a greater redemption coming uh, for which we eagerly await. And that's even true of, of the apostles themselves, right? Um, consider Paul's words in Romans 8, 22-23. I think he describes it quite eloquent, eloquently. He says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, right? So the Apostle Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, he, he's, he's saying that, that, uh, that, hey, we all groan as we await the redemption of our bodies. We groan under the weight of sin in this fallen world and all the effects that it has upon us, right? We're all going to die, that is, unless Jesus returns before that. And when Christ does return, that's when not only those in Christ, not only will we be made perfect in soul, but also in body. All right, the Bible speaks of the resurrection of the dead, that we will have resurrected new bodies just like Jesus, that we will live in for eternity. And so this is the redemption of our bodies that he speaks of. I wonder, do you ever find yourself groaning for the redemption of your failing body? I know that uh, the older you get, the more that's the case, right? So I won't call any of you older folks out here in, in the church, but, but, I, but I know um, that, I mean, that's just how it is, right? As, as we get older, I'm 37 years old, and you know, I, I'm already facing some things that I didn't face whenever I was 30, right? And as we get older and older and older, uh, our bodies, I mean, they just kind of start to fail on us. And we groan, we groan for the redemption of our bodies. Well, first, 
We can take comfort that Jesus sympathizes with us. So again, uh, earlier I pointed out in verse 34, it says that Jesus sighed uh, before he performs this miracle. Well, I came to learn that uh, this word sighed is actually the same word in the Greek. It's the same word as the word groan here in Romans 8. Isn't that interesting? Right, so as we think about how we groan for the redemption of our bodies here in this account this morning, Jesus groans. Right? He sighs as he sees the effects of this fallen world upon mankind. So Jesus groans with us. Right? Don't ever think that Jesus doesn't care Jesus groans with us, and he also groans for us. That is, he intercedes for us by his Spirit with groanings too deep for words. Uh, That's, again, to quote from Romans 8, just a few verses later, right? The Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And praise God, this will one day culminate in our complete redemption, body and soul. But until that day, as the Lord says, Uh, To Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Right? God God has his purposes. Um, Often it's sanctifying, isn't it? As we go through suffering, it it sanctifies us. It makes us more like Jesus. Um, And and though we groan under the weight of that, uh, we can take comfort that Jesus groans with us, that he groans for us, and that one day he will make all things right. He will redeem all things. He will redeem us, both body and soul. And so now we come to the fourth function of a miracle, and that is that it's a proof that Jesus is the promised Redeemer. So we've already talked about the redemption, our spiritual redemption, our physical redemption, as they are pictured in this miracle and in, in, in really all of Jesus' miracles. But in this one in particular, we see that this is pointing to the fact that Jesus that he is indeed the Redeemer who was promised from the Old Testament Scriptures. He's the Messiah who came uh, to bring this redemption, not just to these individuals, but uh, to the world. So one thing that we've very briefly considered is, did this man have a speech impediment or was he mute? And you'll see here in a moment how this relates to this question, to this a proof that Jesus is the promised Redeemer. The question is, did he have a speech impediment or was he mute? Because in verse 32, it says that he had a speech impediment. But then in verse 37, it says, He is in all things well. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. And so we do have two different words here, two different Greek words here behind our English translation with, with different nuanced meanings. And, and, and the question is, why? Why um, would Mark use these two different words. Is is it just to confuse us? Because now we're wondering, okay, well, did he have a speech impediment or was he mute? Well, simply put, um, Mark's primary concern was not clarifying the extent of this man's handicap. But instead, he seems clearly to be pointing to something of much greater meaning. And so, this word uh, in verse 32 that's translated speech impediment. This is a rare word that's used only one time. This is the only time that it's used in the Greek New Testament. It's the word megalalon, all right? It's kind of, it's kind of tough to say, which maybe that's fitting, right, uh, for, speech impediment, for a speech impediment. Uh, megalalon, that's the word, all right? So why did Mark, when he's writing the Gospel of Mark, right, he wrote it in the Greek language, why when he wrote this, why did he use this rare word? This is the only time it's used in the New Testament, Well, this is the very same word that's used in Isaiah 35, 5 through 6, that is in the Greek translation, which would have been common to Mark's readers. Because, of course, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, right? But we have uh, what's called the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And sometimes it's very, very helpful to see some parallels between the Greek translation of the Old Testament and the the New Testament, which was originally written in Greek. All right, so you following me? Because uh, I know this can get a little bit confusing. But, but what we see here is that Mark chose a very rare word 
And I think he chose it very intentionally because, again, this is the same word that's used in this very important Old Testament passage, Isaiah 35, 5 through 6, that is the Greek translation of this passage. Here's, here's what the passage is from the Old Testament. It says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the Megalalon, mute or sp- speech impeded person seeing for joy this passage is pointing to the messianic promise right that there is a messiah that there is a promised redeemer who is to come and so what mark i think is pointing out here is that jesus is the fulfillment of these promises, right? So throughout all the Old Testament, we have uh, this anticipation that's being built. We have all these pointers, all these promises of a coming Messiah, a coming Redeemer. And what's going to be the sign? Well, here's, here's going to be one of the signs that you're going to see people who are blind that can see, people who are deaf that can hear, people that are mute that can now speak. And, and, and Mark uses that same language here to make that connection, Right? So there's a purpose in his word choice. It's not to confuse us so that we don't say, okay, is it a speech impediment or is it the mute? But he's using that word to connect it to this prophecy to show that Jesus is indeed the promised Redeemer. And then in verse 37, using the more common language, uh, the people proclaim, he's done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. All right, so four Four functions of miracles. Uh, and I think this is helpful as we consider all of Jesus' miracles, as we, as we think about how they might relate to us today and why it is that Jesus performed so many miracles. Well, for one, yes, they were, they were merciful acts of compassion. But there's a lot more to it than that, right? They're tangible illustrations of our spiritual redemption. They're a taste of our physical redemption. That is, this physical redemption to come. And then number four, We see especially here, and and in many of these, we see that they're a proof that Jesus is the promised Redeemer. In fact, in the book of John, his miracles are called signs, right? These are signs. These are proofs that Jesus is who he said he was. So as we come to a close, I just want to address one other question very quickly that, uh, that we can't just skip over. And that is, in verse 36... Why did Jesus charge them to tell no one? Why did he tell them to not tell anybody about this miracle? Well, we, we've seen this already, haven't we? We've talked about this some, and so I'm, I'm going to be very, very brief here. But uh, I think that the reason for Jesus saying this is twofold. Uh, first of all, it, he had to manage the crowds, right? One thing that we've seen as, as we go through Mark is that these crowds are pressing on upon Jesus and his disciples. Right? And a lot of them are there for the wrong reasons, Right? They're just there to, uh, to see some kind of uh, spectacular miracle or, or to kind of be entertained. And so, and so he's wanting to manage the crowds. But number two, he's even, he's even doing this to manage the timing of his arrest and crucifixion. Right? Because uh, as, as these news of these miracles spread and the things that he's claimed about himself, right, um, there, there's this mounting plot uh, to, uh, to crucify him, right? To get rid of him. And, uh, and that comes in due time, but Jesus is, in a sense, managing the timing, uh, even of his arrest and crucifixion. But of course, his crucifixion, even that was a fulfillment of another prophecy in Isaiah, and we'll end with this. Um, so we've seen the fulfillment of one prophecy in Isaiah, in that the blind see, the deaf hear, the mute speak. What else does Isaiah say? Isaiah 53 says he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And listen to these last words. By his wounds, we are healed. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful that by your wounds that we are healed, that ultimately it is um, through your life, death, and resurrection, in particular your death, that, uh, that we uh, have been purchased um, for the redemption of our souls and also our bodies. And so, God, we, uh, uh, we just marvel at that this morning. Um, 
we, we marvel at the compassion of Jesus, and we marvel that, uh, that what we see in this is just a taste of what's to come. Uh, that it's a tangible illustration of our spiritual redemption and a taste of our physical redemption. God, we thank you um, for sending Jesus, this promised Redeemer, and for giving us the confidence that he is the one who was promised and that um, he will uh, bring all of his plans to completion. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.